Government IT projects don't have a very good reputation. They're often headline fodder and are often seen as big expensive problems. So why are government projects so complicated, so often prone to failure, and what can we learn from this? Even if we don't work on government projects and what could we do to achieve better results? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I guess that the first question to ask is, do government software projects really fail more often than private sector projects? And the answer appears to be a resounding, yes, they do. One report from the Standish Group estimates that only 13% of government software projects with budgets over $6 million succeed. So, an 87% failure rate is not doing well, really. Most reports seem to put these failures down to some common reasons. Here's one such list. But if you look at the scale of government projects, they're often not especially large, at least compared to other modern global systems. And although it's hard to compare different systems in this respect, they're not obviously unusual in terms of their complexity either. For example, is the coordination of the work of the fire and rescue services in the UK really inherently more complex than planning the logistics of, say, a shipping company or running a bank, providing public cloud services like AWS or search like Google? Or for that matter, hundreds of other complex problems that private sector has addressed, seemingly with more success. The other question is probably, unless you already work in, on government software projects, why should you care? I think that there are a couple of important reasons and answers to that question. The first, and perhaps most obvious, is that we, as taxpayers, pay for these projects and are usually, at least at some level, the people that these projects are meant to serve in some manner. And so we are certainly stakeholders. But of wider significance, I think that the problems of government software projects are not really special to government projects. Rather, it's also pretty widespread in non-government projects too. The stuff that I talk about in this episode is common in many big organisations that create software, government or not. And as well as examples of bad practice in the private sector, there are also obviously examples of good work inside government too. Government software projects do, though, have some additional characteristics that seem systematically to make the impact of these problems worse. But the causes of the failure and patterns of poor results are commonly seen in projects everywhere. So maybe there are some lessons here in these more extreme cases and the greater susceptibility to failure of government projects that we can all learn from. One of these generic causes is that most people, and certainly most organisations, have a profoundly broken model of what software development is really all about, and so organise it very poorly indeed. The really frustrating thing is that while this is seen as a failure of IT projects, it actually has very little to do with information technology, or software development, at least not directly. We are extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, Tuple, Honeycomb and Rad Studio. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about here on the Continuous Delivery Channel to building great software for their clients. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and in software engineering, click on the links in the description below to check them out. Let's look at an example of these government projects. The UK government started a project in 2004 to help to better coordinate the work of fire and rescue services across the country. This project inevitably failed six years later. The original budget was estimated at £120 million, but by 2010, when the project was shut down, they'd spent at least £469 million and had nothing left except nine large buildings, eight of which had never been used for anything and were costing millions per year to maintain, and no working software that was ever delivered. This is a pretty extreme example, 
but not a terribly unusual one. The parliamentary investigation found the following list of causes for the failure, which I'm sure are true, but to me still seem to be talking more about the symptoms and missing the real causes and how to address them. Here are the main findings. The department failed to secure the cooperation and support of local fire and rescue services. This is a pretty classic problem in big software projects, but probably in big projects of all kinds, to be honest. It's all too easy to lose focus on the goals and instead get lost in the process of delivery. Instead of worrying about and focusing on and understanding the problem, we jump to conclusions about a solution, usually to a problem that we've invented. And then we measure our progress against artificial measures of progress, usually focused on process adherence rather than on measures that actually show us whether we're getting closer to or further away from our goal. Following a process is irrelevant if it doesn't achieve the goal. We delivered X features this week. We had a stand-up meeting every day. We're on track with our Gantt chart and so on. This doesn't mean that process is unimportant, but it does mean that process is a means to an end, not the end itself. So process adherence is never a good measure of success. It's not even necessarily a measure of being on the best route towards success. You can easily stick to the process perfectly and still not deliver anything of any use particularly if you chose the wrong process to begin with. Next in the list is department failed to apply effective checks and balances from the start. This is a fair criticism, but it does rather imply that we know what the right checks and balances might be from the start. And the truth is we never do. This assumption that we should know represents a profound misunderstanding of the nature of software development. It's not about the act of coding, it's much more about the act of learning and understanding enough to be able to decompose the problem in sufficient detail to be able to code. That means working in ways that allow us to evolve and correct our understanding as we go, and it doesn't rely on perfect predictions of the future. This is an ongoing process of learning and discovery, and is really about continual learning. Organising to facilitate that is much more important to achieving success than correctly identifying checks and balances from the start. We need to be able to identify and reframe the checks and balances that can guide us as we learn more. This may be disquieting that big complex software projects are a process of exploration and so uncertain, but it is deeply true. And organising on any other basis is at least to my mind, an exercise in delusion, which may go some way for explaining the 87% failure rate. The department's management and oversight of the project was weak. Personally, I doubt that this was the real problem. This implies that everything would have been fine if we'd only micromanaged in more detail. Sure, management and oversight are important, and in this case may have been unusually poor, but even if it was good, that's usually interpreted to mean, in particularly in larger organisations, uh, that we spent an inordinate amount of time getting people to status report against meaningless metrics. That's not going to help, really. Working to figure out what the real problem is and solving that problem is the real name of the game. Next in the list. The department did not approach the project as being one of business transformation, but instead treated each element in isolation. This is clearly a real problem in this case. This was a typical ivory tower project that was imposed on its prospective users without taking into account the reality that the users didn't agree with the premise, the solution or the approach and generally didn't think this project was a very good idea right from the start. Again, we return back to a lack of focus on the outcomes. The next three findings are really shouting at us about the limitations inherent in the assumed approach to the project. One that is so common in big projects in general, and big government projects in particular, that is the assumption that we can come up with a perfect plan, and based on that perfect plan, enough understanding to come up with a perfect contract, so that then we can outsource the development to a bunch of other people. That assumption depends on the idea that this is a problem amenable to some form of software production line where we can perfectly specify what everybody needs to do. That's simply deeply misunderstanding what software development is all about. 
Now, of course, big complex projects need effective management. But my suspicion is that what's in the heads of most big organisation people when they read things like effective management or good contract management is waterfall style development, the traditional approach that almost never works and nearly all projects seem to adopt by default, particularly big government projects. Surely, when beating your head against a wall, there should come a point when the blood and pain should tell you to stop and try something different. Maybe something like opening the door that's next to the wall that everyone else uses rather than trying to continue to knock the wall down with your head. It seems to me that one of the reasons that large government projects are so prone to failure is that the politics and social structures in and around government tend to push people into making dumb decisions. Because we've always done things like that. Surely there's a correlation here between we always do things like that and 87% of projects fail. Wall, meet head. Despite the scale of failure and waste, no one in the department has been held accountable. Perhaps this last item in the findings of the select committee is the really telling one. Where is the feedback loop to help correct things if the contracting companies and individuals responsible for failure on this scale never suffer any consequences for their lamentably poor choices? Not only has no one been held accountable for this project failure, still to this day, but many of the principals involved got promotions, and no doubt the contractors went on to win many further lucrative government projects. I once saw a large government project reasonably close up, and it was staffed with nearly a thousand technologists from over 30 different competing, sometimes antagonistic, contractor organisations. This is not a recipe for success. More time and effort seemed to go into not being held accountable for anything than went into actually building good software. The social and cultural pressures inside government are problematic. At one level, people are afraid of being found to be wasting taxpayer money. So projects are micromanaged to make sure that people are being cheap and cutting corners everywhere. But confusingly, projects like this are also treated as some kind of exercise in massive scale civil engineering, with armies of people being thrown at the problem that would be better solved by dramatically smaller, more outcome focused teams. I suppose that the generous interpretation for this kind of decision of throwing people at the problem is that it's based on the ridiculous assumption that this will allow the project to go faster and so be cheaper overall. This though, despite the understanding that this is not the case and never has been. Something that we've known in professional software development circles since at least the 1970s. So why are ridiculous decisions like this made so often? Well, a less generous interpretation, which is certainly a common factor in some big organisations, is that for some tiers of middle management, their success is measured based on the size of the projects that these people lead and the size of the budgets that they control. So guess what happens? People leading projects like these throw people at the project to enhance their own reputations. If they don't do this, even if they succeed in smaller, simpler projects, their success is wrongly then attributed to the problem being small and simple. The reality though is really quite different. That is, that if we can make a project smaller and simple, then that's what real success looks like. Based on the data, the reality of big government software projects is that if you gave my team the job and we charged half the original estimated price and then went on holiday for the rest of our lives, we will have saved the government £409 million and achieved exactly the same result. Nothing. The list that I mentioned earlier rings very true to my ears. Fundamentally, the route to successfully building any complex system is to begin with a simple system and make that work first. Organise to learn from that. Then organise things to maintain the starting simple system so that it's easy to change. And then change it incrementally, step by step, keeping it working all of the time, learning all of the time. Learn what works for your users and what doesn't until you get to something genuinely useful. Learn what design works and what doesn't, and do more of the stuff that works and less of the stuff that doesn't. 
Learn how best to organize and apply teams, technologies, solutions, and change what you need to as you learn new things that challenge your assumptions wherever they may be. This is the only proven route to success. It is, after all, how all science and engineering works, software or not. Only this way can we figure out what really works and what doesn't. And if we take the opportunity then to fix the real problems that users face and do that incrementally, we can also bring them along on our learning journey with us. And even if we disagree when we start out about what the problem is and how to solve it, we can discover which viewpoint is correct and adapt our understanding and our systems to target that solution, the solutions that really work. This doesn't rely on armies of people but it does take a very different perspective on the very nature of software development and what it takes to make it work. If any of this sounds surprising, then welcome to the Continuous Delivery channel and do remember to hit subscribe and maybe check out my introduction to Continuous Delivery as well. There's a link to that in the description below. Thank you very much for watching. And if you enjoy our stuff here on the Continuous Delivery channel, do consider supporting us by joining our Patreon community. There's a link to that in the description below. And I'd like to say, as usual, thank you to all of our existing patrons for your ongoing support. It's very, very much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>